Hello, welcome to Daily News Simplified, an answer to what, why and how of newspaper reading. Today, we are going to discuss news dated 23rd September 2018 of the New Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. The news to be discussed today as listed on the screen has been divided into two parts. I will be discussing the first part whereas the second part shall be discussed by my colleague Ms. Shubhangi Sharma. Now let us start our today's discussion with the first part. This news appears on page number 1 and also appears as a continuation on page number 11. The news reads US to end H-1B spouse work permits and here it says job prospects of H-4 holders dim where over 90% of 1.2 lakh documents issued for visa beneficiary since 2015 went to Indians. Now this particular news with respect to H-1B visa as well as H-4 visa becomes important from a perspective of events of international importance in your prelims examination whereas in your mains it forms a part of GS paper 2 specifically under effect of policies and politics of developed and developing countries on India's interest as well as Indian diaspora. So in this aspect this particular news with respect to H-1B becomes extremely important. Let's find out what this news is all about. In this particular news the Donald Trump administration is moving ahead with a proposal to end work permits for spouses of H-1B visa holders. And in this aspect, the Department of Homeland Security of the United States is planning to announce the regulation within next three months. Now, as per an earlier executive order of the year 2015 under Obama administration, it had approved employment authorization for dependents of H-1B visa holders. And the dependents of H-1B visa holders included their spouse, as well as children and these dependents of H-1B visa holders were to get H-4 visas for their work authorization. So this current move by Donald Trump administration to end work permit for spouses of H-1B visa holders will affect job prospects of most of the people who go to US under H-1B visa. In this aspect it's important to note that H-4 visas are issued by US citizenship and immigration services to the immediate family members of holders of H-1B visa. And since 2015, more than 90% of the 1.2 lakh employment authorization documents issued for H-4 visa beneficiary went to Indians. So here we can understand that this move of the Trump administration will impact most of those spouses of such H-1B visa holders who are currently working in the United States. This matter, however, is currently pending in the Federal Court of District of Columbia, where the status report of Department of Homeland Security is due on November 19 before the court. Since this is an ongoing news, we'll wait for the final outcome with respect to work permit for H-4 visa holders. So this particular news on ending work permit for spouses of H-1B visa holders become extremely important to understand from an international relation perspective. With this, let's move on to the next news. The next news appears on page number 14. The news reads, Rotating slices. In this particular news, the Kepler Space Telescope has observed about the differential rotation of Sun. And this concept of differential rotation has emerged from the movement of sunspots. So in this aspect, let us learn certain basic facts about this differential rotation system of the Sun. To understand the concept of differential rotation, let us understand first how rotation in solid bodies takes place and in comparison with rotation of such bodies which are not solid. So in rotation in solid bodies, regions that are adjacent at one point in time always remain adjacent as the body rotates. As you can see in this particular diagram where it says that in a solid body, all the points in a rotating solid body maintain their position with respect to each other. Suppose if a solid body is rotating and this is the object, and such body remains adjacent as the body rotates. However, in such bodies which are not solid and rotating, in such bodies, regions that are adjacent at one point in time do not necessarily maintain that configuration. So in a non-solid body which is rotating, the particular objects will not remain adjacent all the time during its rotation. It may shift here or there. And this is known as the concept of differential rotation. Examples of differential rotation can be found in stars and also in some of the giant gas planets. In such cases of differential rotation, the equatorial region rotates faster as compared to regions closer to pole. 
It also means that the sunspots will move faster around the equatorial region as compared to the regions across the poles. And this is the reason why the sun rotates more rapidly at the equator as compared to poles. Around the equator, it takes 25 days for its rotation, whereas around the poles, it takes roughly around 35 days for its rotation. Hence, this small news on rotating slices becomes important. As questions can be asked by UPSC with respect to such basic details regarding differential rotation of sun. Now after going through this discussion, let's go through this particular question. Consider the following statements. Sun rotates slowly around its equator as compared to poles. No, this statement is incorrect. As we know that the sun rotates faster around the equatorial region as compared to its polar region. The next statement is sun does not experience differential rotation. No, this again is incorrect as we have just seen that sun does experience the case of differential rotation. The third, sun rotates in the same direction as that of Venus. Now this is a very tricky statement. Here you have to know three things. The rotation of the sun, rotation of the earth because we know that Venus rotates opposite in the direction of that of earth. So in this aspect it's important to note that sun rotates in the same direction as that of earth. That is from west to east. And this is the reason why for us on earth the sun appears to be rising from the east and Venus rotates just the opposite direction that is from east to west. So the statement says that sun rotates in the same direction as that of Venus is again incorrect. So here the question was asking which of the statements given above is are correct. So the correct answer here would be none of the above. So we understand that how questions can be framed from a given topic specifically with respect to our solar system. So in this aspect, this rotating slices news becomes very important from a UPSC perspective. And in your prelims examination, it gets covered under general science. With this, let's move on to the next news. The next news appears on page number 14. The news reads, new battery may help cut carbon emission. Now in this particular news, researchers at MIT in US have developed a new battery made partly from carbon dioxide captured from power plants. This new battery developed at MIT could continuously convert carbon dioxide into a solid mineral carbonate. Now this new battery developed at MIT becomes important because scientists believe that this new battery formulation can help in reducing emission of greenhouse gases. Now this topic forms a part of general science in your prelims examination. This new battery is made from lithium metal, carbon and a novel electrolyte developed at MIT. So in this particular battery, by incorporating the carbon dioxide in a liquid state, researchers at MIT have found a way to achieve electrochemical carbon dioxide conversion using only a carbon electrode. And the key to achieve this was to pre-activate the carbon dioxide by incorporating it into an amine solution. Since this battery is in a development stage, so we'll wait and find how far is it able to reduce greenhouse emissions. In this aspect, let us also learn certain basic facts about greenhouse gas emissions. Now very simply, gases that trap heat in the atmosphere are called greenhouse gases. And because of trapping of heat by these greenhouse gases, the temperature of the atmosphere rises. Now some of the very common greenhouse gases can be said to be carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxides, fluorinated gases, etc. Now question based on trapping of heat by greenhouse gases was asked by UPSC in the year 2012. Let's go through that particular question. The question was the increasing amount of carbon dioxide in the air is slowly raising the temperature of the atmosphere because it absorbs the options given were water vapor of the air and retain its heat, the ultraviolet part of the solar radiation, all the solar radiations and infrared part of the solar radiations. Now this question was one of the most basic question asked by UPSC with respect to trapping of heat by these greenhouse gases. In this the correct answer was D that is infrared part of solar radiation. So we understand that any issue relating to greenhouse gases and any new discovery which reduces the emission of greenhouse gases becomes extremely important to understand from a UPSC point of view. Hence this news on new battery may help cut carbon emissions becomes extremely important from our exam perspective. With this, let's move on to the next news. 
The next news appears on page number 15. The news reads clue to mystery viral fever. This news talks about SFTS virus that is severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome. And in your prelims examination this news forms a part of general science. Now this particular news talks about SFTS that is severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome which is a TS is a newly discovered viral hemorrhagic fever and this particular disease may be linked to lower levels of amino acid arginine and is also associated with low blood platelet count and immune suppression in most patients now as the name suggests thrombocytopenia which refers to a condition in which one has low blood platelet count and this particular new syndrome that is sfts is a novel flab virus which was reported to be endemic to china in the year 2011 From China in 2011 it spread to Japan in the year 2012 and slowly to other countries such as Korea as well as United States in this aspect it's also important to know about arginine as you can see arginine also known as l arginine is involved in a number of different functions in the body including healing of wounds helping the kidneys to remove waste products from the body maintaining immune and hormone function as well as it dilates and relaxes the arteries for the flow of blood hence this fever is associated with less blood platelet count as well as immune suppression and also this disease is linked to lower levels of amino acid as well as arginine which again has a very important functions in our human body as of now there is no available treatment or prevention measures known so far with respect to this severe fever with thrombocytopenia syndrome thus this news on newly reported fever of sfts becomes extremely important as upsc may ask questions with respect to either sfts or even with respect to its symptoms that is it is linked to lower level of amino acids and arginine and also the fact that it results in low blood lead platelet counts as well as suppression of our immune system hence this news on sfts becomes very important from a upsc perspective The next news also appears on page number 15 the news reads new genetic order identified in this particular news a genetic disorder which was earlier known only in animals has recently been identified to be existing also in humans this genetic disorder is known as ODC1 and in this aspect ODC1 refers to ornithine decarboxylase 1 and ODC1 is a protein coding gene Now the defects caused due to ODC1 can be defined by number of clinical features such as large birth weight, hair loss, enlarged head size, reduced muscle strength, skin lesions, hearing loss, and also developmental delays. In this aspect, it's important to know that ODC1 plays a significant role in number of physiological as well as cell developmental process, including embryo and organ development. so in this aspect this gene odc1 becomes important to remember as it plays a significant role in physiological as well as cell development process including development of embryo and organ and also because of the fact that genetic disorder which was earlier known only in animals has now been identified to be known also in humans and in this aspect the disorder is caused by mutations in a gene known as odc1 which is a protein coding gene So questions with respect to genetic order with respect to ODC1 can be expected in your UPSC prelims examination and the various defects leading to this particular genetic disorders can be large birth weight hair loss enlarged head size reduced muscle strength skin lesion hearing loss as well as delays in development process of a human being hence this topic becomes extremely important from a exam point of view The next news appears on page number 1 in section 2 of the Hindu newspaper. It says frog mast snakes strike back on this marshy island. Divi Sima on the Andhra Pradesh coast is witnessing a spike in human snake conflict as illegal export of frog has depleted their prey base. Now in this particular news the number of snake bite cases in this Divi Sima island has been risen very drastically. and this rise in number of snake bites can be attributed to the loss of their prey as frogs in the area is illegally traded this topic forms a part of 
general issues on environment ecology and biodiversity under your prelims examination so in this particular news decline in number of frogs resulted because of start of trade in frogs the local traders started offering attractive prices to those collector of frogs this further led to the rise in illegal trade in frogs the job of the frog collectors was to trap those frogs from the marshes farms and other sources and in the process they removed the two legs as well as the head before packing them in ice boxes illegal trade in frog from the island included that of bull frog indian skipper frog yellow indian frog and southern cricket frog or indian cricket frog now this effectively impacted the food chain as the local communities hunted those frogs which effectively deprived those snakes from their prey it further says that as instances of snake bite increased the local communities began chasing and killing those snakes so the illegal frog trade also put the amphibians on the verge of extinction in the island in this particular aspect it becomes important to know about food chain as question was asked directly by the upsc in 2013 examination the question asked in the year 2013 was with reference to food chains in the ecosystem consider the following statements a food chain illustrates the order in which a chain of organisms feed upon each other second food chains are found within the population of a species third a food chain illustrates the number of each organisms which are eaten by the others so in this they were asking which of the statements given above is are correct in this second and third is the incorrect statement as food chain are not only found within population of a particular species and the third statement is a food chain illustrates the number of each organism which are eaten by the others no here the correct answer is one only that is a food chain illustrates the order in which a chain of organisms feed upon each other as you can see in this particular diagram which talks about trophic levels and food chain and a food chain also represents transfer of energy as well as matter so in this a was a correct answer so we see that these important news with respect to food chains and depleting of food resources for a particular species become extremely critical to understand from a ecosystem point of view now this talks about the snakes of devi seema it says according to a study conducted by environment protection training and research institute hyderabad the krishna wildlife sanctuary with dense mangroves has many snakes some of the snakes are striped keelback common kukri checkered keelback common trinket rat snake common indian bronze back and common green wig among others so these are some of the kind of snakes found on the island of devi seema about the island of devi seema it says that the island is nestled in the krishna river and in the surrounding regions of krishna wildlife sanctuary and this krishna wildlife sanctuary is a rare ecological region with dense mangrove cover so this becomes another important aspect with respect to krishna wildlife sanctuary so we understand that this news on loss of prey for snakes with respect to disturbing food chain becomes extremely important to understand from upsc perspective as we also saw that a question in the year 2013 was asked by upsc specifically with respect to food chain hence this news becomes very important from a exam point of view with this let's move on to the next news the next news appears on page number 9 in section 2 it says small savings interest rates hike this particular news under your prelims examination forms a part of economic development and in your mains examination it covers under gs paper 3 specifically under economic development so in this particular news the government has hiked interest rate on small savings schemes the increase in interest rates in the small savings scheme will benefit the small investors and also it will help in pushing the investment rates in the country so in this aspects let's learn few basic points about small savings scheme it says that a small savings schemes have always an important source of household savings in india and small savings instrument can be classified under three heads mainly postal deposits savings certificates in the name of national small saving certificate and kisan vikas patra and social security schemes such as public provident fund and senior citizens saving schemes 
so these are the three heads under which small saving schemes can be classified under that is postal deposits saving certificates and social security schemes another important point with respect to this is that a national small savings fund that is nssf in the public account of india has been established and these small savings collections are credited to this particular fund so whatever fund is accrued to these small saving schemes it is credited to the national small saving fund which is a part of public account of india similarly all withdrawals under small saving schemes by the depositors are made out of accumulation in this particular fund that is national small savings fund the remaining balance in the fund is then invested in central and state government securities so this topic becomes specifically important from our exam point of view as all national small savings fund becomes a part of public account of india and all small savings collections are credited to national small savings fund so this news on small savings interest rates hike becomes important specifically from a prelims point of view with this let's move on to the next news the next news appears on page number 10 in section 2 of the hindu newspaper it says rbi asked banks and nbfcs to jointly lend to priority sector and this particular move is aimed at offering lower rates to borrowers in your prelims examination this becomes a part of economic development and your mains this becomes a part of gs paper 3 specifically under economic development so in this particular news the reserve bank of india has issued guidelines to banks and non banking finance companies for co origination of loans to the priority sector and this circular has been issued both to the banks as well as non banking finance companies under this co origination framework both a bank as well as nbfcs and micro financial institutions will join each other in providing loan for priority sector it is expected that such a blending of banks as well as nbfcs and mfis will not only increase flow of credit to priority sectors but will also bring down the cost of credit for the sector substantially the rational provided by rbi is that bank have enough resources but they lack understanding on the ground level including last mile reach whereas the nbfcs and the micro financial institutions lack adequate resources but they are more familiar with the local conditions and also these nbfcs mfis are better informed about business viability as well as credit worthiness of local individuals so combining strength of both banks as well as nbfs and mfis that is micro financial institution will help in providing an ideal structure to address the credit concerns of msme sector the arrangement between banks and nbfcs as well as micro financial institution shall entail joint contribution of credit as well as sharing of risk and rewards between the two institutions in this aspect risk exposure of 20% of the credit shall be on the nbfcs and mfis account whereas the banks shall share the remaining 80% of credit risk thus this news on coordination framework between banks and nbfc and micro financial institutions becomes extremely important from a economy section point of view as questions have been asked on micro financial institutions as well as priority sector lending by upsc examination as per the rbi guidelines priority sector includes the following categories agriculture msme that is micro small and medium enterprises export credit education housing social infrastructure renewable energy as well as others thus this news becomes extremely important from our exam perspective hello everyone now i'll take you to the second part of the video i'll be analyzing the articles which are now listed on the screen time stamping for the same has been given in the description box below this article has been taken from page 9 of the hindu part 1 and it forms a part under indian polity and governance in the context of prelims and it also forms a part under gs paper 2 in the context of mains now this article is very important from both prelims and mains perspective as it is talking about the alcohol consumption globally it also discusses the trends and projections of alcohol consumption and apart from this the most important aspect of this article is that it has touched the relation of india's sustainable goals to alcohol consumption an important point to note here is that the data presented in this article has been taken from 
Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health, which is published by WHO. So this Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health is going to be important from prelims perspective. And the data on global alcohol consumption and its relation to sustainable development goals can form an important answer in the context of mains. So therefore, in this respect, we are going to discuss three important things. Firstly, what is the health consequence of alcohol consumption? Secondly, we'll talk about the trends and projections related to alcohol consumption. And lastly, we'll discuss the impact of alcohol consumption on the United Nations 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development Goals. So let's move forward. Now we all know that alcohol is a very addictive substance which is hazardous to human health. In fact, it will be interesting to note that the use of alcohol has resulted in estimated 3 million deaths globally in 2016. Another surprising fact to note is that the effects of alcohol consumption and mortality are supposed to be greater than those of deadly diseases like HIV AIDS, diabetes, hypertension, tuberculosis, etc. Moreover, alcohol also led to a large burden of diseases and injury in 2016, which approximately caused 132 million disability adjusted life years. Now this disability adjusted life years refers to the sum of years of life which were lost due to premature mortality. Or they can also be understood as those lost years wherein a person lived in less than full health. Now, apart from the health consequences, another important thing to consider in this article is pertaining to the trends of alcohol consumption and the projections of alcohol consumption up to 2025. We already discussed that this data has been taken from Global Status Report on Alcohol and Health which is published by WHO. So this tells us that the total alcohol per capita consumption has increased globally after a relatively stable phase between 2000 and 2005. It is important to note that there are diverging trends in different regions of the world. For example, per capita consumption has increased in the Western Pacific area and Southeast Asia regions which include highly populated countries like India and China. So from this, it is clearly indicated that alcohol per capita consumption has been on the increase in India. Apart from the global trends, an estimated projection of alcohol consumption up to 2025 has also been given in this report, which suggests that the highest increase is expected again in the Southeast Asia region, where our own country is located. And specifically with respect to India, which represents a large proportion of the total population in the Southeast Asian region, it is expected that there will be an increase of 2.2 litres. Therefore, it will be important to remember the future projections with respect to India in the context of alcohol consumption. Also, we must remember the area where there will be highest increase in alcohol consumption till 2025. Moving on to the final aspect of this article, let us try and understand the relationship between alcohol consumption and its impact on the Sustainable Development Goal. Now we know that United Nations has set up Sustainable Development Goals Agenda for 2030 and every respective country has to complete their targets. Herein, it will be important to note that health and well-being plays an important part in these Sustainable Development Goals. Why? Because ensuring healthy lives and promoting well-being at all stages is vital to sustainable development goals. And it is due to this that alcohol consumption becomes a unique risk factor for sustainable development goals as this habit adversely affects the health of the people. Now this information clearly tells us that alcohol consumption has a direct bearing on sustainable development goals. And if we try and reduce the alcohol consumption, it will contribute to many other goals and targets of the 2030 agenda as almost all of the 16 sustainable development goals are directly or indirectly related to health. For example, apart from sustainable development goal 3, which is talking about good health and well-being, which is very directly related to health, there are other sustainable goals such as sustainable development goal 1, which talks about poverty which can be directly influenced by increased alcohol consumption and thus can be seen as indirectly related to health. Therefore, in its finality, it can be concluded that the increase of alcohol intake 
will adversely impact the sustainable development goals along with the overall health of the country now in light of the information which we have just discussed with respect to alcohol consumption i would like you to attempt this question from mains perspective and use the pointers which we have discussed earlier in this video this next news appears on page 14 of the hindu part 1 and it is cutting across two domains pertaining to upsc that is it is talking about an animal known as pika at the same time this news is also talking about dna meta barcoding which comes under the domain of science and technology therefore this can be included in both environment and ecology along with general science in the context of prelims and also forms a part under technology in the context of gs paper 3 please note that in 2013 prelims a question was asked regarding the recombinant dna technology and learning from this we can understand that dna meta barcoding is also important from upsc perspective so let us first understand the news and then we'll come back and answer this question now let us first understand the current context with respect to this news scientists have collected 172 pika feces from five different locations in uttarakhand and this collection revealed that these animals survive almost entirely on specific plants that grow only in cold wet conditions apart from this A further identification was done by means of DNA meta barcoding which helped in identifying the DNA of these plant species in the animal feces and the result of this meta barcoding suggested that the feces collected contained 79 different types of plants and 97% of these are C3 plants so it is in this context that we are going to answer three important things number 1 what are C3 types of plants secondly what do we understand by dna barcoding and thirdly we'll discuss something about this species known as pika so let's move forward now c3 types of plants are those plants that cannot tolerate hot and dry weather in fact they are considered to be the most common types of plants which are found in cool and wet climates and if these plants are present in their conducive environment that is cool and wet climate they are considered to be very efficient at photosynthesis we must also know that currently there is no dearth of c3 plants available so it can be derived that currently pikas are safe however this situation can be changed if the climate change reduces the distribution of c3 plants upon which this species of pika is almost entirely dependent another important thing to keep in mind is that c3 types of plants are widely distributed in the areas of himalayas also for knowledge enhancement purposes the plants which like hot and sunny climates are referred to as c4 plants and they are considered to be most efficient at photosynthesis in these kind of environment therefore in a quick recap we must know that c3 plants prefer cold and wet environment also the species of pika is entirely dependent on this types of plant we must also remember that these types of plants are widely distributed in the areas of himalayas moving on to the next aspect let us also understand the meaning of dna barcoding now under dna barcoding a short segment of dna is used to identify organisms at the genetic level it is done in this way because no two species have the same dna and thus this segment further acts like a black stripe of the universal product code wherein a unique identification sequence is then created on its basis now once this unique identification sequence is created the dna barcodes are created and these barcodes are then put in databases which are finally produced as catalogs incorporating accurate life forms on earth we can also try and understand this process by means of this image suppose we have an unknown organism we extract its dna once we have extracted its dna we will try and create a unique identification sequence or a barcode which is shown here now this unique identification sequence will help us identify the organism at genetic level and also this unique identification sequence or dna barcode will then be stored in a barcode database through which we can correctly identify the species in its finality now let us discuss the final aspect in relation to this news that is the profile of this animal known as royal speaker and then we'll go back to our previous year question and solve it now this animal is a species of mammal in the pika family 
it is important to note that this mammal is found in china india nepal and pakistan so we must definitely remember the territories in which this animal is found apart from this we must also be aware about the iucn status of royal speaker so currently according to the iucn red list this animal is in the least concerned category however we have already discussed that if there is climate change in the areas where this animal is found or if there is a reduction in the distribution of c3 plants then the population of this species might be affected also it should be noted that habitat loss and human habitation in hilly areas are also becoming indirect causes of conservation threats towards this species so finally we have understood that this is a species of mammal it is found in china india nepal and pakistan currently it is in the least concerned status but there are many factors which may contribute towards the loss of this species now coming back to a question it is asked that recombinant dna technology allows genes to be transferred across different plant species from animal to plants from microorganisms to higher organisms now in this question all three statements are correct therefore our final answer would be option d that is under this technology genes can be transferred across different species of plants they can be transferred from animals to plants and they can also be transferred from microorganisms to higher organisms so with this we complete the discussion on this news this news has been taken from page 9 of part 1 of the hindu and it is pertaining to the health problems that are faced by the rescued elephant and rhino calves now this news will be covered under biodiversity in the context of prelims and it also forms a part under gs paper 3 under environment and biodiversity in the context of mains now let us first understand the current context of this news on world rhino day that is on 22nd september kaziranga national park embarked upon an elephant time project and this project is pertaining to the effective health care of the elephant and rhino calves now with respect to this development there are two important things we need to remember from upsc perspective number 1 some key information about the world rhino day which will include the body which launched it apart from it we'll talk about why this world rhino day is celebrated also we'll talk about its significance in india The second important aspect to be taken out from this news includes elephant time project. We'll discuss something about why this project is launched that is the backdrop to this project and then we'll discuss the main objective along with some key points. So the World Rhino Day has been marked as 22nd September which calls for an end to the rhino poaching crisis. An important point to note here is that the World Rhino Day was launched by WWF that is Worldwide Fund for Nature South Africa and it was launched in 2010 and now it is observed by Africa and Asia every year. Now this day celebrates five surviving species of rhino which includes black rhino, white rhino, greater one-horned rhino, Sumatran and Javan rhinos. Please note that in India we find one horned rhinos as far as its significance in India is concerned WWF India's Assam landscapes that is North Bank and Kaziranga Kirby and Long celebrate the annual event by holding various awareness activities which were also done this year and bringing together communities forest departments and local conservation organizations to participate in this event So in this respect we have learned that the World Rhino Day is celebrated on 22nd of September it was launched by WWF in 2010 it is aimed at ending the rhino poaching crisis also it is celebrated by both Africa and Asia every year another important thing to remember is the celebration of five surviving rhino species now let's move on and understand the elephant time project now this project has been launched to cater certain needs of the rescued elephant and rhino calves so let us first understand what are these needs now we know that it is no surprise that many elephant and rhino calves are rescued from the wild and then taken to shelters however a lot of effort goes in taking care of these calves as they are accustomed to the wild so it is in this context that we'll try and understand the problems that are faced by these animals along with their caretakers when rescued Now it is found that elephants have a weak digestive system and the rescued calves without their mothers are fed with lactogen to which they are intolerant 
and the reason behind this lactose intolerance is that dairy milk contains an increased amount of fat and carbohydrate which a elephant calf cannot digest an interesting fact however to note here is that what seems good for an elephant is even better for a rhino calf so in this respect we can also derive that what is bad for an elephant calf is also bad for a rhino calf now in rhinos too lactogen leads to diarrhea or sometimes constipation apart from the lactose intolerance another challenge which is faced by the caretakers is that it is very difficult for the rhinos and elephants to get accustomed to the customized bottles which are given to them for drinking milk therefore now we understand that due to the weak digestive system lactose intolerance along with the difficulty in accepting milk these rhinos and elephant calves are facing difficulties and it is in order to address these challenges that this elephant time project is launched now keeping in light with the previous information the main aim of this elephant time project is to produce a kind of digestible milk which will make relieving easier for elephant calves and in order to achieve this an analyzing machine will be put to use along with getting some ingredients that will be useful in making such kind of digestible milk now in ongoing practice in case of rhinos includes putting them in shallow muddy trenches which helps stimulate their lower abdomen and makes relieving easier however if this technique fails a lot of intensive care is put into relieving the rhinos therefore now we understand what kind of problems are faced by the elephant and rhino calves when they are brought up in captivity wherein the major problem is the lactose intolerance it is thus to address this problem that elephantile project is launched whereby a digestible milk will be produced which will help relieve the elephant calves and rhino calves easier so this ends the description of this news let's move on to the next one the next news appears on page 14 of part 1 the hindu and it is covered under the capsule section this news forms a part under environment ecology and biodiversity in the context of prelims and it also forms a part under gs paper 3 in the context of mains now this is a very crisp news and we need to understand only three things which we'll discuss directly now this news is pertaining to a species of sharks known as basking sharks and it was earlier noted that these sharks had a reputation for being slow and languid however recently it has been discovered that these sharks can jump as fast and as high out of water as great white sharks so it is in this context that we'll remember this species another important thing to remember is that this is the second largest fish in the world and the last important thing to remember about this species is their location that is they are found on the coasts of ireland and scotland Therefore in finality we need to remember that basking sharks are now considered as being fast like great white shark also they are considered to be the second largest fish in the world and finally they are found at the coasts of Ireland and Scotland and this completes the discussion on this news this news has been taken from page 12 of the hindu newspaper part 1 and it is dealing with the mudra loans and associated credit risk Now this topic is covered under economic and social development in the context of prelims and it also forms a part under GS paper 3 in the context of mains. Now why this topic is relevant from UPSC perspective is because a question earlier in 2016 has already been asked from the Pradhan Mantri Mudra Yojana and this article is dealing with the after effects of this yojana. Therefore we are first going to understand this news and then we'll come back and answer this question. Let us first try and understand the current development with respect to this news. Now in the DNS dated 12th September I had covered a article which was talking about the note presented by Raghuram Rajan and the focus of this note was on the current problem of the non performing assets. This article again has been taken from that same note given by Mr Raghuram Rajan but in this article the discussion has shifted towards the credit risk associated with mudra loans. Therefore it is in this context that we are going to understand three important things. Firstly we'll identify some key points about the mudra yojana then we'll discuss how much loans have been dispersed under the scheme and lastly we'll discuss the problems associated with mudra loans so let's move forward so this pradhan mantri mudra yojana was a scheme launched by the union government in 2015 
its aim was to provide loans up to 10 lakh rupees to the non corporate non farm small and micro enterprises that is msme another important feature pertaining to this scheme is that all non farm sector income generating activities which are below 10 lakh will be eligible for getting a loan and under this scheme all banks are required to lend money to these non farm sector msmes by all banks we mean public sector banks private sector banks regional rural banks state cooperative banks urban cooperative banks foreign banks and non banking finance companies that is nbfcs along with the micro finance institutions and therefore it will be these loans that are considered as mudra loans under pmmy now in order to implement the scheme the government had also set up a new institution which was named mudra short form for micro units development and refinance agency limited and the domain of this institution is the development and refinancing activities related to these micro units now here this refinancing is important because we know in order to lend money the banks to require refinancing and it is in this situation that mudra institution comes forward and acts as a regulator for all the micro financing institutions so finally we need to remember that this scheme was launched in 2015 by union government and it will provide loans to those non farming small enterprises whose income generation is below 10 lakh rupees also mudra institution is important as far as refinancing of the banks is concerned please also note that all types of banks are eligible for lending mudra loans moving on let us understand the number of loans that have been dispersed till now under the scheme so a total of 6 lakh crores has been dispersed to 12 crores beneficiaries under the mudra scheme since its inception in 2015 and of these beneficiaries 3.25 crores were first time entrepreneurs and 9 crore borrowers were women now let us understand the final aspect with respect to this article that is problems associated with these mudra loans now in his note raguram rajan specifically pointed out that mudra loans will soon be associated with credit risk and it is in this respect that he highlighted few problems with respect to the mudra loan these include due diligence and repayment challenge by due diligence we mean the inappropriate actions taken by the banks in order to achieve their credit targets however this poses a grave threat however this kind of approach is very dangerous as it leads to the environment of creating future npas an example to understand this concept clearly is that earlier this year the punjab national bank was alleged of abusing their official position why because they dispersed 26 mudra loans which amounted to 65 lakhs and this was done only to achieve their credit targets that is there is no probability whether they are going to get it back or not and hence it is in this context that due diligence which is followed by banks to just achieve their credit targets will create credit risk associated to these mudra loans moving on the other problem is that of repayment challenge now a major problem associated with mudra loans is that there is no requirement of collateral in most of the cases in fact the assets which are being purchased through these loans are considered as collateral under mudra loans and from this statement itself we can understand that such kind of provision can prove very dangerous as far as repayment of loans is concerned it is also important to note that the business of msmes is quite susceptible and still volatile that is there is a risk involved with respect to the loans that are given to msmes as there is no guarantee that their business is going to turn into a short sure shot success therefore this aspect may again lead to credit risk in the context of repayment challenge it is also important to focus on the activities of bank wherein they are only concerned with recovering larger loans rather than small loans as this might be more easy however it is very important to note that such kind of approach has added up to 6 lakhs crores in terms of small loans which are still not repaid therefore in finality we need to remember the concept of due diligence that is in order to sometimes achieve credit targets banks abandon proper due diligence because of which future npas might be created apart from this please also remember that under the mudra loans 
there is no requirement for collateral and in most cases the assets which are being brought from this mudra loans act as the collateral also the business of msmes is still quite volatile and thus there is no guarantee of repayment and finally the approach of the banks to focus on recovering on larger loans rather than small loans has led to the adding up of up to 6 lakh crore rupees under the mudra scheme which are still not paid and they form a part under small loans now in light of the information which we have just discussed let us try and solve this previous year question pradhan mantri mudra yojana is aimed at so the final answer would be option a that is bringing the small entrepreneurs into formal financial system by providing them mudra loans so with this our discussion on this news stands complete now with this we have come to an end of today's discussion let's move on for the question of the day